Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Rudder. I just would like you to wait just a few moments as we get everybody in from the waiting room. Oh, they're still coming. <laughs> Welcome, Derek. And the numbers keep going up. So, <laughs> all right, if we're ready to get started. Hi, everyone. I am Kelly Redder, Executive Director of the Labazo Alumni House on the RIT campus. And, and while the house is currently closed through to January 2021 and well, possibly beyond, we're staking reservations and I encourage you to check out our website in the chat box. As you think about your family gatherings, reunions, business meetings, and conferences, a visit's a wonderful way to reacclimate to RIT, and frankly, parking is a dream. We are happy to have you join us today and hope that you and our entire Tiger family are well. As we continue managing the vagaries of COVID, please know that RIT's Office of Alumni Relations stands at the ready to assist all alumni with a variety of needs, including new virtual program content, learning opportunities, networking, and career assistance. Don't hesitate to touch base. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university in light of all that's happening in the world. We're incredibly grateful for those offers. There are two ways you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers in co-ops. And if your company's hiring, please contact RIT's Career Services Office and allow them to post that position in our system. In addition, as RIT continues to be successful in mitigating the COVID virus on campus, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for both our in-person and virtual Tiger students. In honor of our special guest tonight, we'd like to highlight the Hospitality and Service Leadership Scholarship as a giving option for you. If you're able, please make a gift at the link in the chat box. Now, just a few housekeeping items. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat or question boxes at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to uh, address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you in the coming weeks. A big thank you to our sign language interpreters, Derek Gonzalez and Marie Gellum for being here with us. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well and we'll do our best to get you the appropriate answers. Now, on to our webinar, Virtual Holiday Finger Lakes Alumni Wine Tour. We're happy to welcome Lorraine Hems, lecturer at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where she's well known and respected for her classes in wine and other beverages. She's a proud tiger from the class of 2012, a sommelier, a certified Bordeaux educator with L'Ecole de Vin de Bordeaux. She stays active in the wine industry through various roles with SWE, Women for Wine Sense, and the American Wine Society that have included volunteering, teaching at local events, presenting at national conferences, and sharing her expertise with us. Lorraine is also an active advocate for the wines of the Finger Lake area, the area she calls home. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Labazo Alumni House as part of the Club McKenzie series, celebrating wine, wit, wisdom, inspiration, and intellectual stimulation with your favorite RIT faculty. I so hope you have a glass of wine in hand to celebrate our moderator, our panelists, and the holiday season. Lorraine, thank you so very much for joining us. Our Tiger audience is all yours. Thank you, Kelly. I am so excited about this evening. Um, as you know, I get very excited about anything Finger Lakes and I couldn't decide what to wear. And I have a lot of t-shirts that 
support the Finger Lakes and the wineries that we're talking to tonight, but um, I settled on something sort of uh, warmer, uh, shall we say. So um, I would like to go around and ask each of our panelists uh, just to give a little two minute introduction or so about um, how they how they got involved with this other than being asked that uh, yes they attended RIT and a little bit on their background so I'm going to start out with Todd first. Sure thanks Lorraine and thank you Kelly. Um, my RIT connection basically I enrolled in the fall of 1976 uh, as an undeclared engineering major. After my first year I went to work in a General Motors plant in Rochester and came to the got engaged to get married that same year and uh, decided, do I go back to work or do I go back to school and then get married with nothing in my pockets or do I uh, stay and keep a job? And I chose to keep a job. Um, and, then, and that next year, I also got an apprenticeship to become an electrician. And I went to night school four nights a week at RIT at the downtown campus center. Um, ended up completing a degree in the mid 1980s in industrial technology. And just a side note I want to leave you with, in the fall of 76, I was one of about five or six freshmen who made the RIT baseball team. Yeah. Uh, I didn't play very much, but it was an accomplishment I was very proud of, and it was a great experience. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, Phil, Phil Plummer. Hi, everybody. My name is Phil Plummer. Um, I came to RIT in the fall of, of 2003. And, and by the fall of 2004, I was taking classes with Lorraine. Um, I, I kind of fell in love with, with wine at that point and always felt like it was like my, my back burner Powerball dream. Um, if I ever hit the lottery and had enough money to do it, uh, it was something that I wanted to pursue. And, and while I was RIT, at RIT, I was uh, uh, running a, a clandestine brewery winery in my university commons apartment no, 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 no. Um, that really kind of got me into the the whole winemaking thing. Um, I, I originally started out in, in the bioinformatics program and, and uh, uh, decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life uh, several years in and, and, and kind of sampled and took things a la carte before I found the Center for Multidisciplinary Studies, which is now uh, the School of Individualized Study, and I graduated in, in 2009. Um, in in the, the last year that I was at RIT, I, I got a part-time job at Casa Larga, and that's where it kind of crystallized for me that this is what I wanted to do to make my living. Um, so after I graduated, I, I just sent resumes to anybody who would take them. I uh, ended up getting an internship in the Finger Lakes and Skinny Atlas, and, and um, when that ended, I, I walked in off the street to, to Montezuma into the tasting room, and I've been there for the last 11 years. That's great. Uh, and you mentioned Casa Larga, which also was started by an RIT alum. So uh, we'll put a plug in for them as well. So um, John Wagner, you have a winery that has your last name. You want to talk to us next? I do. Thanks, Lorraine and Kelly. Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in the vineyard, literally, um, in wanted to get away as far away from it as I possibly could when I was young because I just associated it with uh, just work as a, as a child. Um, went to RIT in the fall of 83, uh, took mechanical engineering, graduated in 88 with, a, with an ME degree. Met my wife, Debbie there, who was also in the engineering program. Um, during my time at RIT, I had co-opted at Eastman Kodak and Rochester Products. Um, and upon graduation, worked for Mobile Chemical in Macedon, uh, doing machine design and development. Um, so after a couple of years, I moved into my own company, which was, I had a construction company for four years. And all the while, my dad was kind of working on me to come back and join the family business. Um, and I did. I've been back for 27 years. And... Um, so yeah, we will talk a lot more about what that business entails, but uh, I, I do use a lot of the skills that I learned at RIT every day. So thank you. So Steph Jarvis, you uh, have a little different take on how you got into this industry and what you do, and but give us a little bit on your background, please. Sure, um, so I went to RIT for the four plus one MBA program. Um, I also graduated in 2009 
And when I graduated, there was, uh, we were obviously in a recession at that point. So trying to find a job was pretty tough. And so I was putting my resume out everywhere. Um, I'm originally from the Finger Lakes region. I grew up in a small town called Horseheads. Um, so I was trying to stay in Rochester in the city because I really liked it there. Um, but at the time there was no job. So a mutual friend or a friend of mine that I graduated high school from was working at Hazlitt at the time. And he said, you know, if you're just looking for some part-time work, why don't you come home with me on the weekends? He was also um, going to the U of R. So we both lived in Rochester. It's like, I work there on the weekends and then we can go see our families and come back to Rochester for the week. And I said, okay. So I started working in the tasting room just um, as a tasting room associate. And one day the director of marketing came down and he said, you know, you have your MBA in marketing. Why are you in our tasting room? You know, you should be in the marketing department. And uh, I didn't know anything about wine when I started working there. I mean, I even joke in my interview, they asked me what my favorite wine was. And I said, well, I just drink liquor and beer. Um, and, you know, they laughed and said, well, would you be willing to try wine? I said, yeah. And, you know, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the winery itself and the, the craft and the vineyards and all of that. Um, so I, you know, I started to kind of build a position for myself at the winery at the time, social media was kind of starting and coming up, um, for businesses. So I crafted a position around that. And, uh, then after a couple of years, I realized my love for the Finger Lakes was a lot bigger than just Hazlitt. So I had the opportunity to work for an organization called Finger Lakes Wine Alliance. Um, and John Wagner was actually on that board when I was working there, which was wonderful. And so I worked with them for three years and then was ready for another change. And Hazlitt asked me if I'd be willing to come back. Um, and I said, yes. Yeah. So they, and they, um, I can, should mention Hazlitt has two winery locations, um, one in Hector, New York, which is on Seneca Lake and one in Naples, New York, which is uh, near Canandaigua Lake. Thank you. So I think it would be great for all of us in this big part of the evening to do sort of a virtual tour for people and we'll do it in different ways, but I'd like to start with Phil Plummer. He was definitely a, uh, like many college students, a big beer guy. So it was uh, tough to convert him over at first. But <laughs> Phil, why don't you tell us something about, oh my gosh, uh, three different wineries that you're making wine for and what goes into that. And then um, I'll let you know of any questions as we go. And I'll, of course, have a few questions, but just let us know what you think of even an average day, but how this all all started for you. So, yeah, that's a, a wow. Where do I start? <laughs> um, so, like I mentioned before, um, I walked into to Montezuma Winery handing out resumes uh, 11 years ago because I was looking for full-time work in a cellar. And um, I've been there ever since. And in the time that I've been there, we've launched two other wineries. Um, and, and that's how this list gets bigger and bigger. But if we want to go way back to the beginning, how this, this operation started, um, it's a little bit different story than a lot of the wineries in the Finger Lakes. So that's kind of cool. Um, Montezuma was started by the Martin family um, and, and they got into the business like from a totally different direction than I think most people do. They were uh, commercial beekeepers. So George Martin, the patriarch of the family, uh, worked at the power plant at Niagara Mohawk and, and um, on his weekends and in his free time, he started um, beekeeping and, and it became a passion that, that he really fell in love with. And, and um, they went through a stretch where, where they forced a lot of people into early retirement. And, and he took that opportunity and expanded his beekeeping operation to the point where it was, um, they were running a few hundred, few thousand hives up and down the East coast every year, all year, every year. So it was him, his wife, Jenny, and their two adult sons, um, Bill and Ed Martin and, and Bill, um, Bill and I are kind of kindred spirits in that he was making mead the whole time, trying to figure out, um, how to make the best stuff and, 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 and what to do. And they had decided eventually that that would be a good way to, um, to expand their honey business. So in 1998 in Sterling, New York, up, up near Oswego, they opened Martin's Honey Farm and Meadery. And they started with, with a variety of meads. Uh, mead is, is wine that's made from honey. I kind of glossed over that there. Um, but then they quickly expanded into uh, fruit wines and then eventually into grape wines. And in 2001, they, they opened Montezuma Winery right here next to the, the National Wildlife Refuge. 
and, and kind of expanded on that. Um, if you took Lorraine's Wines of the World One class, you're probably familiar with one of our products, Cranberry Bog, which is kind of what the whole business was, was built on for a long time. Um, so we really have a, a, a pretty robust fruit and honey wine program. Um, but over the years, the, the grape wines kept getting better and better. And one of the things that we realized is that we needed to get outside uh, of the shadow of some of the perceptions of fruit and honey wines. Um, so back in 2013, we opened Idle Ridge, actually just up the road from Wagner on, on Route 414 in Lodi, New York. That's on the east side of Seneca Lake. And that's where we focus on, on all grape wines. So there's um, mostly dry uh, vinifera based wines there. A lot more of the traditional names that, that you will expect to find at, at a lot of Finger Lakes wineries. Um, but we have that experimental spirit baked into our DNA. So everything's got a, a little bit of a twist on it. And that's what, uh, that's what I really love about it. Um, but back in, in 2018, uh, our next door neighbor at, at Idle Ridge, King's Garden Winery, decided they wanted to get out of the business. So, so we bought them out and um, we decided to rebrand. And, and um, the Foss and View story is so good that I feel like I should burn some time telling it. Um, <laughs> well, let's, uh, I think, do we have a picture of the Foss and View one right next door? To so that's the, the view from the deck at Foss and View. Um, okay. Like Lorraine said, it, it's, it's our neighbor directly to the south of Idle Ridge. Um, so directly. We looking, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, there, there's a gravel path. You can walk between the tasting rooms. Uh, you can park at one and, and hit both at the same time. Um, so when we were looking to rebrand King's Garden, um, because we wanted to take it in kind of a different direction, uh, we were looking for, for local landmarks, things like that, that we could use a, a, as a way to, to tie us to where we were. And uh, through our research, we, we learned about the Foss and View camp. And, and, and I had never heard of it before, um, but I was really excited when I did. Um, so on the lakeshore in Lodi is this historic site. It, it's a camp called Camp Foss and View that was built in 1875. And it was built by a, a group of suffragettes and their partners. And they used it as a recreational site um, during the time when, when they were having women's rights conventions in Seneca Falls, which is um, actually where, where Montezuma Winery is located. So it was a tie to the history of where we were and the, and the history of where we, we make our wine. Um, and the, the Foss and View name is, is an anagram. So if you scramble all those letters, it spells seven of us. Um, and, and there were seven people in our ownership group at the time. So everything just kind of fit. Um, and, and Foss and View is, is taking the best of, of Montezuma and Idle Ridge and, and putting it together. So we're still looking to make small batch um, drier wines there, but we're adding some, some fruit and honey wines to the portfolio. Um, and, and it's really been nice because it gives us an opportunity to define what Idle Ridge is at the same time from a stylistic standpoint. So it's been uh, a really great time and, and I stay out of trouble. Uh, I got a lot to think about. Between the three wineries, we're, we're just a little over 30,000 cases, but um, uh, probably about a hundred different wines. Um, so so uh, thank goodness for database software, I'd be sunk. Um, <laughs> So when uh, you went from bees and sterling, uh, sterling renaissance festivals, uh, and then you had to come up with cranberry bog for a different holiday, right? For Thanksgiving sure. time, especially. Um, I warn students that there's uh, a lot of sugar in those wines to balance out that high acid of the cranberry. That cannot be an easy wine to make. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, get, I get anxiety as soon as the, uh, the cranberries show up. Um, <laughs> So, so we source all of our cranberries inside New York state. Um, but the unfortunate thing about sourcing fresh cranberries is that they are ripe at exactly the same time grapes are. Um, but the fortunate thing about them is that they're actually a little bit easier to process after they've been frozen. So, so we send them off to a commercial freezer and then I start getting poked somewhere around March about when we're gonna take them out of the freezer and get to work. And we'll, we'll bring them in and, and they sit and thaw for usually about a month um, before we can do any processing. But it's uh, from, from an effort standpoint, it's probably the hardest wine we make um, just because 
all, all of the, the cool tips and tricks that you learn making grape wines don't ever really apply to fruit wines. Uh, they're totally different chemistry. There's, um, uh, I, I think I spend more time trying to get cranberry wine through a filter than I spend um, making Riesling from vine to bottle. So um, it, it's, it's definitely challenging, but, but it's been something that's paid off for us. So, so we'll continue making it and, and trying to streamline it uh, every step of the way. Oh, so I noticed the clear masks. Yeah. Um, so, so that girl with her back turned um, to the camera, that is Tara Beltrami. And she is our seller assistant. She's also an RIT grad. So she graduated back in uh, 2019 and she's been working with us ever since. Um, Tara is, uh, there she is. Um, Tara is, is very much in the same mold as, as I think um, I was coming out of RIT, just like really uh, uh, long on passion and short on experience, um, but, but willingness to, to, to try everything and, and learn as much as she can. So we're really lucky to have her. And we're, uh, we like to say we're, we're growing Tara up into a winemaker from seed. So, <laughs> well, um, she came from Napa and a former student of mine. And so we made a kit wine together, but uh, she just really wanted to know about cool climate, grape growing. And uh, so it, it's been fun talking to her and seeing how she has grown uh, under your tutelage, certainly for a while. But speaking of uh, when you were talking about these wines and the different wineries and everything, from my standpoint, there's what, maybe over a hundred wines or close to a hundred wines that you make? Yeah, something like that. So when do you decide where they fit? I mean, do you know right when you're making that wine? You know, I think this fits the style of Fossum View or the, the style of Montezuma. I mean, I try to. I try to. That's that's one of the challenges, especially with Fossum View and Idle Ridge, because they're right next door to each other. So we're going to have Riesling at both places. But but what's the difference? So um, we have some stylistic goals in mind for for each of the wineries. I think Montezuma, we kind of treat like our test kitchen where where we're going to try everything and see what works. And, and we really feel like we've got a lot uh, of room to move and, and experiment there. Um, just because that's so, so much a part of our identity. Um, Idle Ridge, the, the look and feel of the place is kind of big and burly. It's a, a, a timber lodge type setting. Um, and, and it makes sense to do bigger, uh, more structured wines there, I think. Um, so we try and, and, and build on intensity for Idle Ridge wines. And, and um, with Foss and View, with obviously the, the, um, the, the female centric history of that name and, and the fact that we've branded it around bees, which are, are matriarchal. Um, we try and push those wines, dare I say, uh, a bit more feminine. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that we are trying to show off that, that, um, that delicate wines that, that have layers and, and, and maybe some floral aspects to them can be just as intense and interesting as the the bigger burlier counterparts up the road cool well i know one of the things that i always when i'm bringing tours through your places and you have been wonderful to rit thank you uh, to the martin family and Anytime. you for all that you do you've done for us but uh, i always have to buy fudge or something else in the gift shops man the gift shops are just so good there so uh, i always have to do a wine food pairing with whatever fudge i'm gonna buy that day <laughs> yeah yeah we're uh and you also have winemaking supplies still at Montezuma? We do. Um, we do. It's not as, as robust as it used to be, okay. um, but we definitely still do have those um, available. So I can usually count on in the fall if I'm, if I'm walking through to, to punch out at the end of the day and I, um, and I make eye contact with somebody that's looking at those, I'm going to get stuck for 20 minutes to explain that. <laughs> how to turn Concord into Cabernet. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a, a, another thing about us is that like I mentioned that there, there's um, four family members that, that really uh, run the business and, and they all have different interests. So um, the, the gift shop is, um, is Ginny's baby. She's uh, really into that stuff. So um so that's something that she runs, um, but, it, but there's something 
for every one of those uh, members of the family to occupy themselves with. B Bill, um, who was the winemaker before I was, he, he kind of um, takes care of the day-to-day -day running the business stuff. Um, and, and his dad and his brother um, take care of the, the buildings themselves. Um, so, so anytime that a new building pops up for us, uh, Ed built it. So it's, uh, we're, we're able to do everything. We, we've got a very much uh, do-it-yourself spirit. Well, one of the questions just popped up from Stephanie, wondering about the gift shops. Is there online availability with the gift shops too? I, I think for some of the stuff, think, but yeah. like we have, I, I mean, there's literally hundreds of items in each of those gift shop. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably a conservative estimate. <laughs> um, so that would be a, a, an insane thing to manage if, through e-commerce. I mean, we basically have to become mini Amazon. Well, you definitely can ship wine. We know that. For sure. For um, sure. Yeah, we can do that. Well, good. I'm going to come back to you when we start talking about wine and food pairings. And oh, cool. uh, I know you've already you already have some picked out for us. So I'm looking forward to that after. And we're going to show off a couple of labels. And then we're going to go to our next speaker who's going to tour. This is certainly faster in our tour uh, than it is for us hopping back on the bus and uh, driving over to another lake. But uh, we're heading over to Seneca Lake now to speak with Todd and have him talk to us about two vines. Hey, actually, it's new vines, Lorraine. Oh my gosh! I I just you see, I did Todd and two and new and no, I like no, to rhyme. No. I like to rhyme. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so here's a picture of our home um, in the fall of 2007. Uh, my wife Danny and I opened New Vines Bed and Breakfast. We're about on the uh, west side of Seneca Lake, about 10 miles south of Geneva. We have a three and a half acre site there, and um, we designed the home to be a bed and breakfast. There are four guest rooms and it just works out. There's one for each of our four children. So they have a place to come home to when they want to. And you can go to the next slide, please, Kelly. So while the house was being built in 2007, uh, my wife and I both liked wine. So we thought, hey, how can we move into this up and coming wine region and not grow some grapes and make some wine? So I, planted about 80 vines in our backyard. Um, I had made wine before, but never grew a grape in my life. And, and so it was kind of interesting, but there's a lot of great resources in this area. Um, Cornell has been a big help to me, um, as well as uh, fellow winery owners. Um, we started with just 80 grapes. Um, I added more each year until we ended up with a one acre block. And, uh, in 2009, you see the red barn there in the picture. Um, myself and a couple of friends put that barn up, so we had a barn. So you can go to the next slide, Kelly. I love this view because it, it kind of shows our proximity to Seneca Lake. Um, this is a actually beautiful site for growing grapes. Uh, we get the moderating effects of the lake. Uh, actually, right below us down the hill, uh, Herman Weimer has their Joseph and Magdalena vineyards, which are quite famous, and they make some wonderful wines from those vineyards. So we are really happy with this site. Um, it's a beautiful spot. And if you also want you to notice that between the barn and the vineyards, you'll see a rather large garden. And I've, I've been a gardener my whole life, and I really enjoy gardening. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is my wife, Danny, and I. We are partners in this business. We have no employees, so we get to wear all the hats. Um, so I wear a hat called vineyard manager and maintenance man and gardener and winemaker. And my wife, Danny, wears the hat of, you know, a vineyard and, and seller hand and chef and most importantly, chief financial officer. We both also share the sales and marketing hats that we have to put on from time to time. And uh, you also notice from our sign, uh, we, we got our farm winery license back in 2011. And I'm pretty sure we are the smallest farm winery in the Finger Lakes. The next slide. So here's a picture of our vineyard. Um, I decided early on, maybe it was because we're a bed and breakfast, but 
I wanted the vineyard to not only be functional, but also be very aesthetically pleasing. Um, so I, I planted grass in rural middles, which some vineyard managers told me that's not how you grow grapes. And uh, the under row, um, it's all mechanical cultivation. We use no herbicides, but I just, I just wanted it to, to look beautiful as well as be functional. Um, unlike when you go to a lot of wineries in the Finger Lakes where they say uh, the keep out signs around their vineyard, we always encourage people, as long as it's a day I'm not spraying, uh, take a walk in the vineyard, check it out, see how grapes grow. It's, it's really a beautiful experience to walk in a vineyard. And so we always encourage that for people that come. Next slide. So this is a picture of two of our Riesling rows from this year, probably a couple of weeks before harvest. Uh, you'll notice in the right-hand row, you can see fruit exposed with sunlight shining on it. Um, we go through and pick a uh, leaf pull on the east side. These are north-south oriented rows. Uh, the east side, we leaf pull, expose it to morning sun. You'll notice the row on the left, you see no fruit. We leave the leaves on the west side so they don't get sun scalded in the hot afternoon sun. It's just a process that I've had good success with and, and so I like to work that way. Um, a note here, we do everything by hand. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know the other wineries here on, on this panel and throughout most of the Finger Lakes are quite large, a lot of automation. Uh, we, we have very little automation. Everything we do, leaf pulling, hedging, uh, cluster thinning, shoot positioning, all done by hand. The only thing I do on a tractor is cultivate and spray. Um, here's a picture of two of our Lemberger rows, again, just prior to harvest. And, and my philosophy is basically that great wine starts in the vineyard. And so I spend a lot of time out here. We touch every cluster multiple times, make sure there's great sun exposure, uh, make sure that we get good ripe fruit. Um, you know, the size we are with just an acre of grapes, um, I can afford to spend that time and, and try to, to get the best quality fruit I can get. Next slide. Okay, here's just a, a picture of uh, right after we just harvested our Marquette grapes this year. Uh, you'll see the boxes of the grapes laying down the rows. We pick everything by hand. Um, sometimes we get, we do it, just Danny and I'll do it, or sometimes we'll get some friends to help. Um, it, it's, these grapes will then get hauled over to the barn uh, to be processed. You might also notice the nets rolled up. Yep. Uh, we net almost all of our vineyard uh, protect it from birds and deer and turkey and everything else that likes grapes. So next slide. Here's a picture of my wife helping me on the crush pad. We've got the crusher de summer set up. I'm dumping grapes in. Uh, they're dropping into our basket press. We press and the juice gets pumped into our basement where we do our fermentations. And next one. And then here's the final product. Um, all of our wines are estate wines. If it doesn't come from our backyard, then, then I'm not processing it. Uh, we produce nine different labels. We have four whites, three reds, a dry rosé, and a ruby style port. And we produce approximately 300 cases of wine each year. Uh, to put that in perspective, I think most wineries in the Finger Lakes produce thousands to tens of thousands. I think I heard Phil just say they produce 30,000 cases. Yeah. We produce 300 cases of wine. Um, I'd be remiss here if I didn't mention Peter Bell from Fox Run. Uh, I have worked harvest with Peter for the last nine or 10 years. Uh, we've become very good friends. And I can honestly say that I've learned most of my winemaking skills from Peter. Uh, the thing I love about Peter, he's a great teacher, uh, but he, he lets me make wines the way I wanna make wines. I mean, he, I can consult with him. He can give me information, answer my questions, but these wines are my wines but I'm, I'm fortunate to have someone like that to, to get, gain information from. Um, being as small as we are, uh, we, we are too small to work with a distributor, so our, our wines are, are typically pretty hard to find. We're in a couple liquor stores. Um, we're, at times, we're in some of the local restaurants, but if you wanna try our wines, uh, the best way to get your hands on them is to go to our website at newvines.com. We have a buy wine page. Um, if you're local, Give us a call. We can do curbside pickup. We would love to get some of these wines in your hands. We are a very small production, but uh, people tell me these wines are pretty darn good. So yeah. <laughs> um, if Kelly could go back a couple slides, 
I'm just wondering the first slide that you come back to Kelly that shows the soil you've done such a good there we go such a good job taking us through you know from start to finish essentially you didn't show a bottling line <laughs> but Todd can you tell me what types of soil and I I think it's very interesting John will be able to show us a, a picture in a few seconds um, that'll talk about what different things we deal with in this area but what soil do you have on your property for our soil geeks Listening. Okay, there's um, on a soil map, it's actually called Farmington. Um, it's kind of a, a silt loam kind of kind of combination. Um, it it's a uh, it drains very well. I mean, we're on we're on a shale bed. So um, I planted every one of those vines by hand. And I tell you, some of those posts are sitting right on shale. I mean, it's pretty shallow here, um, but it, it's a good soil. Our site is is quite vigorous. Um, almost too vigorous sometimes, but it, it's a uh, it's really really a wonderful site. Well, I know you had mentioned Peter uh, B Peter Bell at Fox Run being such a good teacher, and one of the nicest things that I've heard about the Finger Lakes is how everyone seems to cooperate with one another and everyone wants to help because it raises the whole area up instead of feeling like you're competing against one another. And I know Phil would agree with that as well. But um, what? challenges do you have do you think what are some of the biggest challenges on the small scale well um first of all to echo your point lorraine um i have been a major beneficiary in in the nurturing nature of the finger lakes wine industry um many people have helped me uh, all of my neighborhood wineries have helped me and i feel good when i get a chance to give something back even on a small scale to them but it is a wonderful industry to be a part of um, I mean, some of the challenges are, you know, without any automation, everything's done by hand, the, the time commitment. I, I mean, I spend eight to 10 hours a day in a vineyard and you think about one acre of grapes, how can you do that? But um, again, striving for the best quality fruit that we can. Um, but some of the things like you'll, you'll probably hear from Stephanie later about marketing. I mean, so when I've got my vineyard hat on or my winemaking hat on, you know, some of that marketing and sales stuff kind of slips through the cracks. So. Uh, believe it or not, we we struggle to sell uh, our 300 cases of wine sometimes. I believe it. I believe it. And we'll talk a little bit maybe at the end about how some of you have had to switch with some of our uh, recent COVID precautions and regulations. Um, but if we could maybe thank you, um, and then we'll come back to you a little bit later and then move on to John Wagner. Yep. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. I love thank this you. picture. Thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me all right? Somebody said the volume was not quite loud enough. Is that I can okay? hear you. Yeah. Okay. So I want to start with this slide to just kind of put it in context where we are in the Finger Lakes. Uh, so this is the 11 Finger Lakes. Um, we are located on the east side of Seneca Lake, right where the cursor is. Um, and there's a reason that we're there. This, this slide was taken April 1st, 2015. Um, from space and you can see all the Finger Lakes frozen over except for Seneca Lake and the majority of Puga Lake is still open water. Um, so half the volume of the Finger Lakes is in Seneca Lake and it's 640 feet deep. So for this reason, it hasn't frozen over since 1912. Um, and that open water really moderates our, our winter temperatures um, and it really we, we are on the, the east side of the lake there. Uh, we get a prevailing northwest wind coming across the widest point of the lake and it really does moderate our winter low temperature. So five generations of my family have grown grapes um, on, this, on this site. And it are, we really, I think our stories kind of are all different uh, for the panelists here today, but uh, our history is grape growing. And my great grandfather grew grapes and was planting them with a horse and doing everything by hand. And my grandfather was fortunate enough to get some of the land that we're on right now. Um, and then my father, uh, who's Bill Wagner, um, really took it to the next level. And uh, if you could advance the next slide, please. So he, he was a lifelong grape grower for the Taylor Wine Company. And he took a trip to Europe in the early 70s with my mom and some other area grape growers and really toured a lot of winemaking regions over in Europe and saw for the first time winemaking on a small scale. 
So up to that point, he had really he delivered his grapes to the Taylor Wine Company and seen uh, winemaking on a, a massive scale, 100,000 gallon tanks, very, uh, very commercialized and very difficult to imagine how a grape grower could go from growing grapes to becoming a winery. Uh, on that trip to Europe, he really saw winemaking on a small scale, people making uh, wine in their, in their garage or their barn behind their house. Um, smaller vineyards and everything. So it kind of hatched the idea in his mind that I, I maybe could make this leap from uh, being a grape grower to um, having a winery. So unbeknownst to a lot of us in the family, he kind of came back and started planning the winery. Um, and then in, in 1976, we kind of had the perfect storm with the New York State passage of the Farm Winery Act. Um, and what this the Farm Winery Act allowed grape growers to get in the wine business. Um, it really lowered the bar as far as, as financially how much you needed to get a license. And the, the, the other big change is it allowed us to sell retail as well as, as wholesale. Um, prior to that, if you were a winery, you had to sell through the three-tier system. So being able to have a tasting room and sell retail really uh, made the numbers line up. So. Um, my dad was a big project guy. He, he was always wanting to do everything himself. I think that's kind of, that nature kind of runs in the wine business and Phil alluded to it and Todd did as well. I, people like to do things themselves. So he designed the building. Um, it took us three years to construct the building. Uh, we built the majority of it with the, the current vineyard crew that we had at the time. Um, our grand opening was in June of 79. Our, vin our first vintage was 1978. So at that time, we were producing wines primarily from the grapes that we were growing for the Taylor Wine Company prior to that. So French American hybrids and some native varieties. Um, we are 100% estate bottled. Um, so as, as Todd said, uh, he, he grows all the grapes for his wines and we do as well. We are currently producing about 30,000 cases a year. Um, all those grapes come from our farm. Um, we also sell grapes to about 30 other wineries uh, throughout the Finger Lakes and the East Coast. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So over the course of the, the last 40 years in the wine business, we have transitioned from those varieties that we were growing for the Taylor Wine Company to what we really think we can produce and it shines on our site. So um, all of our new plantings have been vinifera varieties. Um, we currently have the largest and most diverse planting of Riesling um, grapes in the, in the state. Uh, we have over almost 30% of our farm is devoted to Riesling right now. Um, so we've really made a huge commitment to that one variety. Um, we, we think that it is the, the one variety that can uh, transcend this local marketing. We are now carried in a lot of states uh, with the Riesling. Pennsylvania just picked up our Rieslings. Uh, we're distributed in about uh, 24 other states as well with, with those wines. So it's, it's a slow process when you're a state bottled to be able to transition varieties. Um, this, this vineyard that we're looking at right here is an aerial view of what we call our Kwood East block. Um, it's a block that my grandfather used to grow Concords, Niagara's, and sweet and sour cherries on. So um, when we transition to planting vinifera on here, it is honey oil loam soil, which is uh, pretty well-drained soil. Um, it's got deep soils, so they're classified as over 80 inches to any obstruction. Um, any shale or bedrock layer. But what we did in this block was we supplement with pattern drain tile. So this has over six miles of underground drainage in this vineyard. It's a 15 and a half acre block. Uh, so it's a huge process to really plant a vineyard. And especially when you're planting vinifera, um, you really have one shot to do it right. And it's, it's an expensive endeavor. Um, after tiling, uh, we plant the vines in the spring. It takes uh, about three years before we do get a, a crop off those vines. Um, if you look real close, you can see the, the mechanical harvester is right out there in the middle of the vineyard. So I'm glad I don't have to hand pick every single one of these berries. Um, we, do, we do a tremendous amount of hand passes during the growing season. 
And our goal is to get uniform ripe fruit at harvest. And hopefully we've done all the handwork at that point. And then we're able to play the weather a little bit and let uh, grapes hang longer and really develop super ripe flavors. Um, and then we come in at the peak of ripeness and we pick them with a mechanical harvester. Uh, we, we have a 2020 Gregoire harvester, which is the, the kind of state of the art for harvesting. It's very gentle on the vines. Um, one of the unique features of this machine is after it harvests the fruit, it has onboard destemming. So it destems the, the grapes, the stems are deposited back on the vineyard floor, and then the grapes are also run through a sorting mechanism on the machine, which will sort out any kind of uh, uh, leaf or, or petiole that gets in there. And really we're delivering just clean ripe fruit to the winery. So uh, it also enables us to do a lot of uh, night harvesting. We like to pick Riesling cool. So we'll go out a lot of times at, at night and pick Riesling and then have it cool and, and at the peak of ripeness when it delivers to the winery. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So one of the, one of the other things that uh, we've done in the last four or five years is uh, really tried to embrace solar energy. Uh, two thirds of our operation now is powered by solar. So um, the majority of our roof systems, um, this is our uh, equipment warehouse, and you can also see our wine warehouse in the background, uh, are completely covered on the roof with, with solar panels. So uh, we're, we're also really looking in the vineyard, how we can minimize our impact on the environment. And uh, again, as Todd mentioned, permanent sod cover in between the rows, uh, you know, that's, that's what we do as well. Um, when I grew up, I, we, we clean tilled everything. So we were disking every inch of every vineyard several times a year, which made everything look beautiful, but it really made us somewhat vulnerable to uh, these heavy rain, rain events where we can get some erosion. These are, these are steep sites that we have on the farm, which make them awesome for growing grapes. Really nice air drainage where cold air flows down the hill at night, but it does open up the, the potential for some uh, for some erosion. So we choose to use permanent sod in the, in the row middles. Um, we, we grow about 150 acres of organic hay on the farm. So we, we mow and bale our own hay and we unroll the, the hay in the centers as well. So adds some organic matter back in the soil, helps prevent erosion and uh, really helps retain moisture, especially in a dry year like we just, uh, just had. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Uh, I didn't pick the slides, Alex picked this, that's me, um, getting onto a harvester. I, I do get a chance to, to use my engineering degree from RIT. We, we have a lot of equipment that we have either built ourselves or modified to suit our needs. As I spoke, the, the site is very steep sloping and a lot of times the equipment that we get isn't quite exactly what we want. So we'll either modify it, it doesn't, doesn't really seem like it's ours until we start Cutting it, cutting it with a torch and, uh, and changing it around a little bit, then it seems like it's ours. So um, I believe that there's a short video that uh, Kelly is gonna share for us that just gives a, a little idea of, of what it's like uh, at, at harvest time. So we are gonna, we're gonna see harvesting fruit um, and delivering it to the winery all within about a minute here, I think 59 seconds. So here we go. This is the view looking over the uh, cab of the harvester. It uh, is straddling the row. It's, it's able to vertically adjust so it can stay vertical as it transcends hillsides. Can you guys hear me over the video or not? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. So this, this is the gondola, <coughs> gondola transferring the grapes to one ton bins at the winery. And this is the rotary forklift. <coughs>
it uh, it happened pretty quick in the video, but <laughs> there's a lot of work that that happens behind the scenes leading up to that point. Um, but we we really are able to get uh, fruit from the vineyard to a tank sometimes within 30 minutes, and uh, it really by by having complete control over the entire farm on when we harvest and all the operations we do, we can really uh, play what is somewhat changing weather at harvest and and really get the fruit at the ideal uh, time for us. And a lot of times that means, uh, you know, carrying on a little extra risk because we're letting fruit hang uh, through a rain event. And maybe we think after that rain event, we're gonna get enough time where the fruit will rebound and, and has the potential to get even riper. So um, it's, it's a little nerve wracking at harvest. Uh, we, we have 225 acres of grapes um, and over, over half of that is vinifera at this point. So uh, these, these late season varieties, Riesling and the Cabernets, uh, you're, really, you're really letting them hang a long time and, and you've got to get through a lot of weather before you can get them in. So um, 2000, 20. It's been a it's been a rough year with everything going on, but it was uh, really a an awesome vintage. Um, really hot and dry. The growing degree days was off the charts for the Finger Lakes, and really got super ripe fruit. And it really was kind of a a, a little more leisurely harvest because we we didn't have a bunch of rain events to jump around. On. So, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is our, our, our lineup of Rieslings, which uh, we've really kind of staked our, our, our brand on. Um, and really have, have seen these pick up traction and get picked up in other states and really gain distribution. And as we've done that, we're able to, to kind of ride in on some other wines after that. And Cabernet Franc is, is what we feel like is gonna be the, the red that is really going to take over. Uh, we've been planting Cab Franc like crazy. We, we now have 23 acres of Cabernet Franc and we're, we're growing that as, as quickly as we can. Um, we, we make our traditional red Cab Franc out of that and we've also started the last five years making 100% dry rosé out of our Cabernet Franc which has taken off very well too. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. We're, we're distributed by Opeachy in all throughout New York state. Um, and then we, we have several distributors in other states. We are also in Total Wine and More, which is, uh, they're in about 24 different states. So we have all the Rieslings in th those stores as well. Um, we, we usually entertain a lot of guests here at the winery. It's been kind of a, 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 different, a different year for all of us. Uh, we've made a lot of changes here in the, in the winery to, to, to keep everybody safe. Um, so we're seeing a lot fewer people, but we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of online sales, and we still are open. But we've changed to a reservation only um, at the winery, which really helps us control the flow of people coming through. Uh, really makes for a more intimate tasting because we are limiting tasting groups to six. Um, so it's it's working out well. It it's just. Uh, it's been a tough year as far as uh, we've had to make a lot of changes uh, throughout the building to, to really be able to stay open. So, well, I know I'll order some if you deliver with the harvester or maybe uh, well, we, we can arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe. Um, thank you, John. We'll head down uh, just down the road a little bit. Uh, it's not very far at all down to Hazlitt and uh, their one location. And then uh, Stephanie will talk a little bit about another location over toward Naples near Canandaigua Lake. And uh, Stephanie, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about Hazlitt, and I think we might have a video as well for this particular winery. Yes. Good, good, thank you. All right, so um, my role is a little bit different than the other panelists on tonight. Um, I'm the director of marketing, so my goal and my job is to get to share all these awesome all these awesome things that these wineries are doing all the time um, and you know what our winemakers and what our vineyard manager is doing which is awesome um, and I absolutely love it and so uh, you know we're located in Hector New York which is also on the eastern shore of Seneca Lake the winery was started in 1985 
um, in Hector by Jerry and Elaine Hazlitt. If you want to go to the next slide, um, there's a beautiful picture of them standing at our horseshoe bar. There they are, um, toasting. Um, so they started, Jerry started the winery in 1985, and one of the first wines he made was a wine that you all may know called Red Cat, um, made from red Catawba grapes. Red Catawba grapes. Um, at the time, Catawba, most Catawba wines were pink, um, and Jerry liked to be different. So he added some red hybrid grapes to the wine to give the wine that ruby red color. Um, and make it stand out. Um, and if you've had the opportunity to drink Red Cat, it's a, like a sangria style type of sweet wine. Um, you know, we call it our get your party started wine and it has a lot of fun innuendos and stories. Um, so um, as the years have gone on, um, Jerry and Elaine have passed. So now their daughter and son, Lee and Doug uh, Hazlitt are the co-CEOs of the winery. If you wanna go to the next slide. It'll show a picture of them um, toasting in our vineyards. Um, and Lee kind of does, takes on like the retail role um, in overseas retail and marketing where Doug is more into the business side of sales and distribution kind of thing. Um, so it's a really good brother sister combination and it's fun to get to work for a family um, that's so wonderful and kind and it, it's, it's a blast. Um, so in 2011, I think this will be our next, um, and this is actually a picture of us on our harvester um, picking grapes in the same vineyard that we just showed. This one is overlooking Seneca Lake. Um, we, you know, we grow all of our dry wines, so all of our vinifera wines are all estate grown. Um, and then we have our sweet wines, which we purchased those grapes from area farmers in the Finger Lakes because we produce so many cases of those. There's no way we would be able to grow that many grapes um, in our vineyards. So we have, um, so it's a really nice balance. Um, and to touch a little bit on what you guys were saying earlier, the Finger Lakes community is amazing. Um, that's one of the reasons I loved falling into this industry is how wonderful everyone was and how kind they are. Um, you know, I've said a hundred times, you know, you meet somebody and you say hello and they ask you how you are, but in the Finger Lakes, they genuinely want to hear your answer. They want to, to know how you really are. And um, I think that's wonderful. And so it's been so great to be able to see the camaraderie and the community and everybody work, working together. All the time we have wineries, different winemakers stopping in to see our winemaker, to taste wines and run tests in our lab and, and vice versa. So that's really cool to get to see. Um, so you can move to the next slide. So in 2011, uh, the winery uh, decided they wanted to take full control of production of Red Cat. So um, this is actually in a little bit of a partnership with RAT and Constellation Brands. Uh, we purchased the old Widmer Winery facility in Naples, New York, which is now called Hazlitt Red Cat Cellars. Um, it's a 3 million gallon facility, which is enormous. Um, so we have other businesses there. So we have our tasting room, which is a small, um, pretty much like a small snapshot of what we do in Hector. Um, then we have our production facility over there. So we'll crush all of our grapes for our sweet wines over there um, because it's such a large capacity. Um, there's such large capacity wines. We need that kind of equipment. And then we also have a, a second business over there called East Coast Crush and Copac. Um, where we do winemaking and packaging and producing wine for companies all over the world, which is amazing and so much fun. Um, so we're able to utilize the tanks in the space and the warehousing. Um, so it's not just all of our wines that are, are being produced there, which is pretty neat. So you can move to the next slide. Um, this, is, uh, this is in the bottom of one of the buildings, the many buildings over in Naples. Um, and these were old barrels that got brought over from Europe back in the er like 1930s. And it's just a really cool, um, there's so much history there. Every time I go to Naples, I, I always make sure to bring somebody with me to give me a tour because I still get lost. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, and there's, like I said, there's so much history and this is some of it. So I always like to show this picture because they're, they're amazing wine barrels to show. Um, so you can move to the next slide. And this is a, this is a picture of the actual facility, the whole facility. Um, so this is the, 
you know, East Coast Crush and Copac, our warehouse, our, our tasting room, all of that. And, um, and these are some of the vineyards. So some of the vineyards we have in Naples, um, we use those grapes to go into like our port wine and our sherry. Um, so they get picked fairly early. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's nestled into the hills of Naples, New York. It's a quaint little town. It's absolutely gorgeous in the fall. It's my favorite time to be there. Um, and so you can go to the next slide. And this is a picture. Um, so the gentleman that's there, he's our vice president of winemaking. Um, that's Tim Benedict. And these tanks are full of red cap wine. Um, you can see those red lines at the bottom. Those are actually the tubing that goes um, for the filter into the tanks. Um, so that gives you a perspective of the size of gallonage that we're producing of, of red cap. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So it wouldn't be, um, you know, because everybody here is on the panel as a, a winemaker or an owner, I thought it would be really cool for you guys to actually get a Hazlitt story from a video that we produced. Um, so this, this is a short video. Um, it was produced a couple years ago. So the director of marketing isn't me um, in the video. It's um, now our director of business development and sales. Um, but Lee and Doug are telling the story and I think they do such a great job. So I wanted to make sure that we were able to share that with you today. So you can go ahead and play. The wine business, I guess you could say, started back in 1852 when my six times great grandparents came here and bought the original piece of property here in Hector and started growing fruit, mostly grapes, back in the day. We have control of the grapes right from the get-go. We have one of the best vineyard managers in the region. You know, a lot of wineries, they just buy the bulk wine and bottle it. Being in a state winery makes us different. Jerry Hazlitt made about 2,000 gallons of red cap that first year. We grew Catawba grapes and all the old timers called the Catawbas the cats. My dad thought, well, you know, I, I think it'd be neat to make a sweet red wine and call it red Catawba and shorten that to red cap. Well, between the great quality of the wine as well as the camaraderie and the community and the friendship, red cat really started taking off and has become what it is today. We bought the old Woodmer Winery in 2011. And we just needed the space. With, with Naples and purchasing that is it allowed us full control of our production. You know, it allowed us a facility that we can grow into. Have full control allows us to make the best quality wine we can make. Everyone can find a wine here that they're gonna like. We've got some of the best award-winning viniferas. We also have Red Cat, Cabin Fever, Brambleberry, sweeter wines, and everything in between. We try to make it fun and it's casual. Um, so people come in and they find something they like, they have a great time, munch popcorn. Some people we discovered are ready for a cold beer or a slushy. We came up with the idea of the Oasis, which is a beautiful timber frame building here on the property. And it's just a place for uh, people to go after a tasting or instead of a tasting. We are in the Finger Lakes region of central New York. And um, I've obviously lived here my entire life, grew up here uh, right on Seneca Lake. And it's pretty, pretty amazing place. I've, I've been all over the place from Alaska down to the Caribbean and in Maine. And I haven't found a place that I like any better. Okay, so, um... You know, the one thing I also wanted to share, I did touch on this a little bit, um, you know, Red Cat was the wine that got us started and we made, you know, we have a great portfolio of sweet wine um, and beautiful dry wines, but we also make hard cider. Um, we don't talk about that as much. Um, it's not in distribution um, and it's not as easy to find. You can get it at the winery and there's some local Wegmans and some local areas close to the winery that carry it. Um, but Doug is right, you know, we do have many products for many different people, um, taste profiles. And like, like uh, John Wagner, we're also distributed by OPG. And you can find most of our products in New York State stores. Uh, we can ship wine to 33 states in the country. Um, and we're mostly distributed down the East Coast, um, hopefully working our way West soon. Um, so yeah. I, I, Lorraine, did you have any other, did you have any questions? No, I just wanted to say, it might sound like we're tooting our own horn sometimes uh, when we say, oh, you know, we're so friendly here in the Finger Lakes. And yet I can tell you, you could tell us 
that we know many people that have been in the industry that have moved away that said, oh my gosh, everyone's so competitive in this area and people don't work together. Mm -hmm. And, and exactly. it's just, oh Welcome my gosh, you know, that um, my, it, it's not my, uh, as friendly my, maybe in some other um, areas that they've uh, seen oh, that happen. Well, but also- um, um, Yeah, we're streaming live on multiple whoop. channels. Fingers Do we crossed. have I mean, I Todd or somebody, see. somebody live no. here? No. Somebody's not muted? Well, I'm just talking to myself. Oh, I, I think I see what's going on. Okay. Um, I think that's just a testament to how warm we are. are that, I mean, that's what you're referring to. But also I had a former student, Rebecca, say, oh my gosh, Hazlitt, Red Cat, when you took us there on that tour, it's not just about drinking. I think that's what some people right. have a hard time understanding, that wine is to be enjoyed with food, wine's to be enjoyed with friends. That's Those are the memories we're creating. And so, oh, wait. Was that a good segue to maybe talking about wine and food for the holidays? <laughs> so, Stephanie, thank you. Um, we'll uh, move on to this next, and we'll have everyone sort of jumping in a little bit here on what they'd recommend for these pairings. So we've done our tours. Now we're ready to sit down and have some food. And uh, Kelly has done a tremendous job of putting some of these together and pictures. And um, I did not eat ahead of time, which is a problem because now we've got uh, all these food ideas. And then I just would like to go through some of the pairing suggestions that each of the winery has chosen to go with this. And I might rotate how who starts out first. But um, uh, Phil, with the Pinot Gris. I think some people are familiar with Pinot Grigio and maybe that gets a bad rap sometimes, but this is a little different. And so why would you choose this with the Feast of the Seven Fishes? That's a great question. Um, so so there's uh, a couple different ways, like a couple different places in the world where they're famous for Pinot Gris. Um, and, and this actually, the, the one that we have released for Montezuma is built more in that Italian style where it's, it's really acid driven, fruit forward, uh, lots of lemon aromatics. So I think all of that works really well with, with uh, fish. It's really light bodied, uh, crisp acidity, which is um, kind of the key to, to a good food wine of any sort. Um, and, and just really complimentary, light, fresh flavors. Thank you. Um, Todd, new vines. What would you like yeah. to say about the dry Riesling? Well, um, some people talk about uh, white meat, white wine, um, that doesn't always hold true, but uh, Riesling works really well with seafood. Uh, and as Phil mentioned, you know, the acidity really works, uh, brings your mouth alive with these flavors. Um, I would also, I didn't put it on the list, but our, our Gruner Veltliner also works really well with seafood as well, so. Sure. Um, and then uh, John, we sure. talked about Kaywood. Yeah, I'll echo what everybody else said about dry Riesling and, uh, and seafood and fish. So we have two dry Rieslings, our classic dry Riesling and also our Kaywood East, which is our single vineyard. Um, the Kaywood East is always our driest and I think it really is a super food wine. Um, it may be a little too dry for some people without food, um, but with, with dinner, it's, it's amazing and just picks up a, a lot of the, the, those uh, the, the acidity in there cuts through a lot of the flavors and really leaves you with a nice clean palate. So instead of that squeeze of the lemon wedge that you yeah. use your Kaywood East. And then uh, Stephanie. Sure. Um, so Lorraine knows this about me and some of, I believe John knows this about me, but I am not a foodie by any means. I mean, I'm one of those people that orders grilled cheese and a glass of Riesling when I go to a restaurant. So I did have some help on some of these pairings. Um, as you can imagine, with that kind of palate, seafood's not really one of the things I eat often, but I do know um, to echo what you guys all said about Pinot Gris, um, it, it does complement seafood very well. Um, and then I also wanted, so what we did is I had our winemaker share a dry wine and a sweet wine for those, so you had a couple options. So our White Cat Fizz is 100% Niagara wine and it's carbonated. So that makes it, a, you know, normally Niagara wine is a sweeter wine, but the white cap fizz with the carbonation makes it a little drier. So it is a really nice complement with, with the seafood. Yeah, as my students know, I'll talk about scrubbing bubbles and uh, with the sweetness, I certainly know that there are some spicy seafood dishes out there that people would enjoy that wine with. So how about our next one? Let's see what we have here. Next up, Hanukkah desserts. 
and this one was uh, kind of interesting what we came up with. And I uh, was going to pull some ice wine out of the fridge, uh, but let's go through these. Um, how about uh, Stephanie? How about uh, talking about the Cab Franc and Vidal? Oh, sure. Um, so both of these are really great to pair with desserts. Um, the Cab Franc, you know, goes very well with, you know, a dark chocolate or something of that nature. Same with our Brambleberry wine. Um, that's yeah. sweeter wine for those that like the sweeter style that it, it's like um i can't even we make brownies with brambleberry wine dark chocolate brown yeah. for the wine yeah. in instead of water um and then the ice wine is a beautiful dessert wine so we make that wine traditionally pick the pick the grapes frozen off the vines and press them while they're frozen um and it's just it's really like thick coating in your mouth and it, it goes really great with dessert or by itself um, either way it's great well, I know some of my students, if I'm going to serve them uh, ice wine, some of them will say, oh, my gosh, it's too sweet. Like, try it with the brownie or try it with the creme brulee. And all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off. So how would you talk about your Riesling ice, John? Sure. Yeah, I get that comment all the time when I'm, people are tasting ice wine. Oh, it's too sweet. And I'm like, OK, think about what you eat for dessert. And uh, that's why we paired this Riesling ice with, with this dessert. It just um, really concentrates all the great things about Riesling, but it also concentrates the acidity too. And that's one of the things that you can make an ice wine that finishes at um, you know 15 to 19% residual sweetness, but it's got that acidity as a backbone to balance it. So I, I think it would pair very well with this dessert course. Yummy. And Todd, uh, maybe a little uh, Lemberger. You said, well, I don't really have a dessert wine, so. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in a list, there's there's desserts listed, but there's also, you know, braised brisket, root vegetables. Um, Lemberger is a very earthy wine, and it pairs very well with with root vegetables and, and barbecued meats and things like that. So that's why I suggested Lemberger. And Phil, what do you think I have in my fridge? Oh, you're muted, Phil. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm no, that's trying okay. to, to cut out feedback. Um, I, I think you probably have it left over from a virtual tasting a few weeks ago, no? It keeps. Um, yeah, so so ice apple cider, it's the, the same basic principle as ice wine, um, but you're starting with apple juice. So the idea is, is that when you um, freeze things, uh, when you freeze juice and thaw it, that acts as a, a chemical separation. So all of the, the, the juice that thaws first is going to be sweeter. It leaves a lot of the water behind. So it allows us to concentrate the acids, the, the, the sugars, and all of the flavor and aromatic compa compounds that are in that apple juice. And then we can um, ferment them out just like an ice wine. And it, it, it finishes with a, a very similar texture and, and flavor, but it's, it's more of that fresh apple cider flavor. Good. So we have some questions coming up, and I think especially with the ice wines, uh, what do you think about exporting? Have what's the? <laughs> we can't go to Canada right now uh, from the U.S., but have have any of the companies exported to Canada, or how? I know it can be tough. Or shall, we'll save that. How's that? We'll save that. We'll stay on the food, and we'll come back to that for one of the questions. Okay. Okay. So next, Kelly. There we are. Okay. And uh, Todd, do you want to talk about the Cabernet Franc? Sure. I, I've changed. I now have some in my glass, our 2019 Cab Franc. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful structured wine with great dark fruit and it goes really well with, you know, beef tenderloin or any type of red meat and would be an ideal Christmas meal wine to pair with. Wonderful. And uh, how about John? the Grace House Pinot Noir. I wanted to use this for a, another webinar and it was out. So I'm sure. glad to see it back in. Yeah, so we have we have a couple of really nice dry reds that, that we could have picked for this course. Um, Alex helped pick this one out and really thought that the, the Grace House Pinot would, would not overpower um, some of the, the beef tenderloin. And we, we have a nice Meritage as well, um, but actually the Pinot uh, really would go well with this, with this meat. Super. And uh, Stephanie?
Yeah, sorry about that. I was muted. Yep. No um, problem. So um, we picked two wines here, the Red Cat. Red Cat goes really great with um, any type of meat with a sauce like that. So we thought that would be a really great pairing. Um, and then our Cab Sauv is beautiful. It's tasting beautiful right now. It's full bodied. Um, it has really great tannins and a great acid backbone. So it really complements uh, that type of a dish. Um, so we thought that would be a great fit as well. Great. And then finally, Phil. It's actually what I happen to be drinking tonight. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so there's a couple of stories to tell with this wine, but I'll try and keep it quick. Um, Noir A is a hybrid variety that was developed at, at Cornell University. They have a, a pretty extensive grape breeding program where they're looking to make um, grape varieties that are lower input for a climate like ours. So um, out here where we have um, a little bit cooler climate and tends to be a little bit more damp, um, the, the vines require a touch more input to make sure that you don't have rot and fungus developing. Um, so a lot of their breeding program is, is geared at, at, at producing varieties that we don't have to um, invest as much in sprays or, or, or in, in careful manicuring um, that you would have to do with a lot of the vinifera, vinifera varieties. And Noire is one of the success stories of that program. Um, one of my personal um, projects that I take on every year is that I try and recast a different hybrid grape. Um, my, my personal opinion is, is that a lot of these varieties have been miscast over time um, and, and they really want to do different things than what we're all doing with them. So um, we had the, the, the fortune of working with a, um, a family in North Rose, New York that, that grew grapes for us for several years and, and they decided to get out of the grape growing business um, and, and go back to apples. So they ripped up their whole vineyard um, last year. So 2019 was our last vintage. And uh, I had always wanted to try this technique called a passamento, um, which is an Italian technique where you dry out the grapes before you ferment and it gets you really good concentrated flavors. Um, and, and I didn't have a space to do that, but you can kind of do that if you have a way to cut the, the fruit off from water. And since those vines were gonna get killed anyways, I figured I'd never have the opportunity again. So I had the grower um, once they got ripe, go through and cut all the trunks of the vines and we hung them for an additional month uh, <laughs> to let them dry out. And, and, and this kind of touches back to the Noiré story from before. Um, Noiré is really thick skinned and it clusters really loosely. So I didn't have to worry about those grapes rotting out there for an additional month. And then we brought them in and, and we left them on skins for, for about a whole month. Um, but it's just a really rich, concentrated red wine with a lot of uh, a cool, spicy and floral accents. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I'm just picturing Halloween with trunks hanging out there in the vineyard. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. Um, what I did not expect is that the vine was going to still try and um, send nutrients. Yeah. So like it, huh. they started oozing like this, this jelly out of the, 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 cuts where the trunk was it was pretty wow. cool and now we know okay and then finally i smell some bubbles okay so uh fossum view there we go phil would you like to talk about the airy acres riesling so the the pairing here is is focused around some some really spicy foods and one of the best ways to pair off spices with a little bit of sweetness um, Airy Acres is a vineyard in uh, Inner Lake in New York on the west side of Cuga Lake that we work with. And, and their Riesling um, tends to really hang on to its acid. So I like to finish the fermentations from that farm with a little bit of residual sweetness. And, and it, it really balances out really, really nicely. And I think would work uh, perfectly with, with especially the jerk chicken. And Todd, semi-dry Riesling with the feast. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with what Phil said about, you know, when you've got something spicy, uh, my wife and I drink dry Riesling almost all the time, but when she makes something spicy for dinner, out comes our semi-dry, and it's, uh, ours is about 2.5% residual sugar, and a little bit of sweetness really works with spicy food. Okay, yeah, I, I love spice, but uh, I don't think Stephanie's going to have a uh, spicy grilled cheese. I just have, I have, I'll get to her next, but John... <laughs> You know, I talk yeah. about the Fathom, it's a different one. 
It, it sure is. So yeah, we decided that this, this would really cut through that spice. And uh, so this is Fathom 107. It's named for uh, the deepest point of Seneca Lake, which is right in front of our farm, which is 107 fathoms deep. Um, it is a blend of Gewürztraminer and Riesling. And the Gewürz really goes well with spicy food. Um, the first year we made this blend, we started out with a 50-50 percentage split between the two varieties. And we quickly found out that when you mix Gewürz at half with Riesling, you get Gewürz. So, the Gewürz is toned down, usually runs about a third of the blend, and the Riesling is about two thirds, but it is bone dry and it really would do super well with this, uh, with a spicy meal. Good, and then finally, was I right, Stephanie? Are you gonna I have mean, pepper jack? Yeah, I mean, you can spice up a grilled cheese a little bit, um, but one of, you know, one of the wines in this kind of piggybacks on what John was saying is we chose our 2018 Gewürz demeanor um, if you've never had a Gewürztraminer, I like to describe it as, you know, the potpourri of wines. Um, and it it pairs great with spicy food. There are some spicy foods I'll eat. Um, and and Gewürztraminer does such a great job. It's really light. It has a, you know, ours is, is very dry. It's a 0.2% residual sugar. Um, but it, it does pair really great with Asian style foods or even turkey. We love to serve um, Gewürztraminer with our Thanksgiving meal. Um, and then Red Cat Dark, that's going to be a little sweeter. That's a Concord based wine. Um, so it's 100% Concord. So think about like Welch's grape juice as a kid growing up, um, but now with a bit of an adult kick to it. Um, but again, sweet pairs really nicely with spicy. It's such a great compliment. So that's a really great pairing as well for those that like the sweeter style wines. Good. I love spice. I love bubbles with spice. How am I doing there? I think we're coming up to it. It might be a little different this year, but uh, how about the Red Cat Fizz? What do you think, Stephanie? What would you serve that with at your New Year's Eve? We have much to celebrate. Oh yeah, I mean, 2020, wow, what a year we've had, right? So Red Cat Fizz is our traditional Red Cat wine and we've carbonated it. So if you're normally not a sweet wine drinker, trying the Red Cat Fizz is actually a great, um, a great option because the carbonation does cut back that sweetness a little bit. Um, but I mean, you could drink that with anything that you want. Uh, one of the things that my winemaker always says to me is he said, there's no wrong pairing. Whatever tastes good to you with your wine is a great pairing. Absolutely. So, you know, everyone's palate's different. Everyone's going to taste wine differently. Everyone's going to think one food tastes better with a certain wine, but whatever you love is, is what matters. Phil, I had somebody just pop up. Anne said that they had the string of pearls at Thanksgiving time and it was a hit, a great wine. So what would you serve it with for your New Year's Eve? Um, well, the uh, the Chinese dishes jumped out there. I, yeah. I think um, probably something with a little sweetness and spice. And, and thank you for the nice comment, Anne. Uh, I appreciate that. It's always good to hear good feedback. Um, but yeah, this is a sparkling Riesling. It's made in, in a, a technique called Method Ancestral. It's a little bit different from Champagne because you're, you're basically using primary fermentation to get your bubbles instead of cleaning the wine up and putting it through a second fermentation. If you've ever had a, a Pet Nat, that's made in the same style. Um, there, there's something that I really like to make too. Um, but it's just a, 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 a sparkling Riesling with a little bit of residual sugar. And I think it's perfect for, for what's listed there. Beautiful. John, sparkling yeah. Riesling. Sure. Yeah. There's a common theme here, isn't yeah. there? So, uh, yeah, this, this has got a little bit of sweetness to it. And uh, I really think it goes well with the, the whole idea of the afternoon snacking with hors d'oeuvres and everything. It just, it, I haven't really found a food that it doesn't go with um, those bubbles cut through a lot of the flavors. I think they'd go well with the Chinese and uh, just a really nice fit, especially with a little bit of residual, residual sweetness in there. Well, and I think you touched on earlier that uh, Riesling is certainly what we're known for internationally, but Rosés and, and Cabernet Franc are really exploding in popularity, not just here, but elsewhere. So it's uh, something to look forward to. I, I think you know, trying any of these, but let's, I, is our last slide just sort of a end all because I don't want to end quite yet. We have just a couple minutes left. Yeah. Um, 
Abigail, I have a feeling she's asking because she might live in Canada at this point, but um, do any of you export to Canada or what could we possibly see in the future with that market? We've got some dry Riesling up there right now. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of resistance to uh, going up there with ice wine because they make so much ice wine up there. Sure. Um, we have been able to get some export on the ice wine to, to China, but not, uh, not to, to Canada. Anyone else? Is it just tough? I don't see much Canadian wine here. Um, I know there's certainly different taxation issues. Nobody else? I think it's just tough to export period. Yeah. I, there's like, you're chasing regulations for, for every different country and, and, and they may have different labeling requirements, things like that. You have to get new distribution deals for, for that. So for a lot of these smaller wineries like we have around here, it, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense just yet. Um, but, but I know New York Wine and Grape Foundation is making a, a, a really significant push to, to make it more accessible. Yeah, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Phil, I would continue. Just off, okay. offer yep. one more thing. We do have our, our Riesling Select will be going to Canada um, within uh, six months from now too. So the, Good. we will have a couple Riesling offerings up there. Good, well, I know I like to stop in Buffalo before I, like to, before I go to Canada and pick up some Finger Lake specials um, because they've been pretty supportive of stocking some of the wines from, our, from this area. And uh, maybe Abigail, once we figure things out, we can have you back on this side of, of the falls and you can buy some that way. Um, also, I've had uh, <laughs> at least one person say, hey, this has been a wonderful tour, but when are we going to do the real one? And literally, um, just about the day the state shut down, I was calling the day before to a few wineries and saying, I have to cancel. And everyone was really, really are going to sort of get caught up in the hype. And well, we're all going to be doing our part. And I know uh, most of you are doing tastings by reservation still or doing some options, some pivot, if we'll use that word. So I highly encourage any of our people that are listening and people that will be listening in the future to go to these sites, call the wineries, find out what they're doing because they want you to be engaged in all of the excitement that is the Finger Lakes wine region and or brewery at Wagner or ciders at Hazlitt and uh, on and on and on with the list. But I think we're getting very close in time. Do you want to hop in here, Kelly? Yep, I'm coming back. I uh, just wanted to say uh, there's still a few questions out here, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, sure. In there. Uh, first one is the craft brewing industry in New York State exploded over the last past 10 years or so to the point where the market became oversaturated as evidenced by the recent failure of numerous breweries, no doubt also partly due to COVID. Over the same time period, they've seen some similar, albeit slower growth pattern in the Finger Lakes wineries. What do you believe the saturation point is for Finger Lakes wineries? How many wineries can the Finger Lakes reasonably be expected to support in terms of land and resource availability, as well as a profitable customer base? That's a hefty question. Hefty. I'll, I'll just say, if you're my size, lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also kind of an apples and oranges con comparison. Um, it, and this may just be, I may be wrong about this, but the, the, the look of it to me is that there's less of a barrier to entry on, on a small craft brewery than there is to a winery. It feels like those are easier to, to, to bring online fast and, and maybe you can bring them online fast without a lot of experience. Um, I think wine to get started is such an investment that it, it you have to be pretty committed um, to, to, to even just get rolling. Uh, and I think that that sorts out some of the, the businesses that, that, that open and close really quickly. How do you feel about the distilleries too? He mentioned brewery. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of curious, you also have a, a distillery uh, on site at Montezuma. Do you see more of that happening as, as we move forward? Well, I'm not going to talk trash about distilleries. <laughs> um, 
No. Um, no the, <laughs> I, I think Marsh. <laughs> I, I just think they're different animals. I, I think, I think uh, a lot of what you see, it, at least from my standpoint in craft brewing, is you see like home brewers that, that kind of take the project out of the garage and into a storefront. Um, and, and I think those are what you see exploding and then crashing um, so quickly. Uh, I, I think when, when you talk about wine having barriers to entry, um, multiply that by 50 and, and you've got the barriers to entry for a distillery. It's so much more heavily regulated. Uh, the equipment investments are, are, are really significant. Um, so, so I think that the distilleries kind of like there, there's a commitment level to getting into that and people tend to, to, to stick with it. Um, I don't know. I, I think it makes sense for, for where we're at um, just because it's a, a, a bit less saturated. And it also makes sense to have a distillery at, at a winery because you can kind of pitch things back and forth. Um, we make some fortified wines where we capitalize on that. And um, we can use our facility to, to make a lot of the, the base wines that end up being brandies and, and things like that. So it, it just kind of works for us. And, and I don't, I'm not saying that it works for everybody else that way, but, but distilleries, like I said, it, it, it takes an awful lot to get into that business. Um, so, so I don't think it's, it, it's so much as the uh, flash in the pan um, as you see with some of the home, home brewers that, that, that start small craft breweries. Thanks, Phil. Um, I, I know we're hitting on time, but I have one last question that, I, that I'd like to share. Uh, this is from Gary, who says, thanks panelists for your time and sharing your passion. I truly enjoyed the webinar. I've been to nearly all of the wineries, but it may be time to go back. Just curious, who would you say has the best dries and uh, dry reds in the region? I, mean, I think I Lorraine know. should answer that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I told Gary I'd do that privately. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. And I know you all love your wines like your kids. And uh, I had Hayden Wagner in one of my classes. So I'm not going to put you on the spot about your kids. But um, I think that to have somebody say, oh, New York State doesn't produce any good reds, that's when you'll see my hair get even bigger. So um, I'd, I'd love to recommend many reds. And part of it is um, that many of the people that are listening are, are saying, I, I haven't been there since 88. I haven't been there in so long. I plan to come up this summer and we welcome everyone here uh, to come up and visit. Um, I've been blessed to have this in my backyard, but sometimes I forget about it. So put it on your destination list and come visit the Finger Lakes. So I'll go out on a limb with the dry red question. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'm biased because this is somebody who, who taught me in the early days how to make wine. Um, but if you're not paying attention to, to shale stone, shale vineyards, stone. Yeah. all they do is dry red and, and, and they knock it out of the park just about every time. Um, so, um, so if you, if you get a chance in season, they're, they're very small operations, so limited hours. Yes. Um, and, and they only run spring through fall. But, but there are some really stellar dry red wines there that, that I think deserve a bit more attention. And gee, isn't that just down the road from a lot of the people that are here tonight? Why, well, yeah, it. yeah, it's <laughs> awful close. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you, Lorraine, Todd, Phil, John, and Stephanie, for your sharing your passion and knowledge with us all. All audience members will receive an email from us within a week or so with a link to today's webinar recording. And a reminder that these Tiger webinars are available on the RIT Alumni Association YouTube site. You can view a full listing of upcoming virtual events at www.rit.edu backslash alumni backslash events. We have several each week and we'd like to include you in as many of these as possible. Please exit this webinar by simply closing your browser window and please do let us know what you thought of the webinar through a brief survey that you'll receive via email as well. Have a wonderful week, stay safe, stay positive and stay your course. Happy holidays, one and all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hi, guys. <sighs>
<sighs> There's still a few people on, but I don't think anybody would mind. Everybody breathing? I think so. I think so. Who else is left? Wonderful. Uh, looks like there's. Uh, I can change my view. Eleven people still. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's still ten uh, attendees. But I just wanted to say thank you personally for everything, Lorraine. You're amazing. Todd, fabulous. Phil, a font of information. Um, it, it, you guys were just wonderful, and I really so I, appreciate yeah. It. I want to know, is that Debbie or is that John? Because we had John earlier, and then it looks like another John joined. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think Oop, Debbie. Gone. <laughs> that settled yeah. that. Yeah, that <laughs> Might have been. Great. Thank you. Thank um, you, Kelly and Lorraine. You guys did a great job. Uh, the panel was wonderful. It's great. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, I just I wanted to want say one. I'm sorry with the, you know, I, I running a slide show for six of you is really interesting <laughs> no 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 no. you did no, this you was did wonderful yeah. this was yeah. awesome i'm okay. just really glad the video portion yes um as well as it did i was so yeah. happy about that that worked out We're nicely great. yeah um but and i look like i've been drinking red wine i don't know <laughs> it must be the you know, lighting i will say that i, don't know why. Uh, I am <laughs> going to be drinking red wine <laughs> now so look at my best to you all Thank you yeah. very, very much. Yeah. Obviously you, some interest hours. and, um, you yeah. know, I mean, we should do it again sometime. Right. Thank oh, you. I, I think we probably will. Okay. And I'll follow up with each of you sometime tomorrow or the next day. Okay. Stop by Thanks anytime. so much, Kelly. Good night. Great Good night. job with everything. Take care. Bye. Bye.